Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the elders for the opportunity for allowing me to do this. Um, big shoes to follow behind Luke. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that well, but we'll see what I can do. I've done it a time or two also. Um, <clears throat> several weeks ago, uh, I was listening to a podcast, uh, sitting in a car for 12 hours at a time, and about 3 o'clock, there's no cars to chase, so I have no one to pull over. So I, I listen to these podcasts all night long, and it ranges everywhere from sports or politics and history shows and wide gamut, just a lot of different things, 20 some of these things. So I was listening to one, I can't remember which one, but the narrator mentioned Joseph of Arimathea. And he said that had he not asked for the body, would he have gotten the ground so that he could return to life? Because as a prophecy, we were told that he would raise from the dead and come out of the ground. And I started thinking about that. And this is a story that we all know pretty, from, we're all familiar with it because um, it, it's a very common story that we hear. And I had never thought of this before. And I started thinking about it. And why was it Joseph that went to ask for the body of Christ? It wasn't Peter. And just moments earlier, Peter was ready to fight with a sword and even swung at somebody to fight for Jesus. And not only that, he, he proclaimed his faith and his loyalty to Jesus just moments earlier before the scene. But the apostles weren't the ones that buried Jesus. They weren't thinking about that spiritual fact. So as we look at this scene, we need to consider Joseph's faith here and how he was willing to go and risk his own life to ask for the body of Jesus because it was the Romans... Uh, routine to just leave the body on the cross and let it rot and decay as a sign to other people who were traitors and the slaves that they should be obedient to the Romans. So for them to ask, this was an odd thing for them to pull Jesus off the cross. Let's read the reading again in Luke verse, uh, chapter 23, 50 through 54. I want to apologize. I'm working out of a King James Bible tonight. Um, I ordered a new English Standard Version, but I don't have mine anymore. So I had to Return to my old Bible. Luke 23, 50 through 54. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewed in, fine, in stone, where, wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. These acts of Joseph were that of belief in salvation and in Jesus. Joseph, being a disciple, here in my version it said that he was uh, awaiting the kingdom. So we know that he's a disciple of Jesus. He was waiting for Jesus and knew that uh, for him to return, he had to be buried to return from the grave. Which between him and Peter, which are we when times get hard? Do we know how we would act in those times? There are numerous examples and uh, shown and teach us of discipleship in the Bible, and I want to work through a couple of those tonight. First, uh, Christians will not always win a popularity contest, but we must continue to show the world who God is. We're identified as a peculiar people who are called out and that we're different over in 1 Peter 2, 9, verse, uh, 9 through 12. 1 Peter 2, 9 uh, through verse 12. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should uh, show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may be your good works, which they shall behold, um, which they shall behold glorify God in the days of visitation. We should not expect to fit into all groups in society. Jesus and God have called us out of the world to be different. And we see that in Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
we're told to not conform. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul here says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. By Paul's statement, being living sacrifices is the exact opposite of being in the world. One thing that's, which sets us apart would be us teaching others. We're always told that we should be uh, willing and uh, able to teach those around us. 2 Timothy, 2, uh, verse, uh, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4, shows us that we're supposed to be preaching the word. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall turn away into fables. If we are always preaching the word, we will be seen as different in the world. And as an example, I think of Elijah back in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, where he stood up to the prophets of Baal. 1 Kings 18 is an example of setting ourselves apart. After this scene, he even goes out into the wilderness and he tells uh, God that he feels like he is the only one left in Israel. So that's how alone he felt by being um, a disciple of Christ. Let's go ahead and read 1 Kings 18, 21 through 24. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long ha uh, had she uh, between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under and I will dress the other bull and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And ye call in the name of your gods, and I will call in the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. If we skip to verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said to them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. So we see here with Elijah that we will not win popularity contests, but we must continue to show the world who God is by our example. Secondly, regardless of society, we must, show, uh, we must be an example for our families. The Old Testament must give us many hints about leading our families. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, um, we are told to in internalize God's word and always teach our children. Deuteronomy 11, 18, and 19. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when they'll rise up. So we're told that we're always supposed to be teaching the word to our family and being an example to those around us. In Proverbs 22, uh, we're told if we teach our children that they should stay um, in the way that we teach them. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 is, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, we all understand this verse, and uh, Jerome's been using it recently in his lessons also. Um, even as children, uh, God instructs us to be examples uh, of discipleship. 
So over in Ephesians 6, we're told to uh, honor our parents. Ephesians 6, in the first four verses there. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Even as children showing respect for our parents, we are demonstrating obedience to God, which is teaching others about Christ. Over in Genesis 6, we find an example of Noah being a great example to his family. Genesis 6, beginning in verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou make to the ark, and in a in a cubit shall thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shall thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. But, thou shalt, uh, but with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort thou shalt bring into the ark to keep them alive unto thee. They shall, they shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee. And it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Here we see that Noah's being that example to his family by following what he's been told to do. God told him to do something, and he did it. And by doing this, he saved his entire family. My next example or will be, um, my next point is, even though the worst can happen to us, we must remain faithful disciples. Paul charged Timothy to keep the faith in 1 Timothy 6. I'm going to turn to 1 Timothy 6. Verses 11 and 12. But thou, a man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, goodness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on to eternal life, wherein thou, um, whereunto thou all art also called, and hath professed a good profession before many witnesses. So Paul tells Timothy to keep the faith, and Paul also warns of threats to Timothy's salvation here and stresses his obedience. Paul also tells of pressing towards the mark and remaining faithful in Philippians 3 and verses 13. <coughs> Philippians 3, 13 through 21. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting these things which are behind, and reaching forth unto these things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even un this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto ye have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also you look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, charge our vile, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, According to the working thereby, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Paul tells us that if we uh, become like Christ on earth, 
he will make us like him in heaven. We are told to rejoice in his sufferings, though, in 1 Peter. So while we are acting according um, and we're keeping the faith, we're supposed to be rejoicing in the sufferings that befall us. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, insomuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceedingly joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified." Uh, also over uh, in Romans, Paul continues the same uh, line of thinking, that the sufferings here are not that bad in Romans 8 and verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. Paul is telling us that we should, not, that we should be comforted by this, um, knowing that these sufferings are not as bad as we think they are now, but know that in heaven they're going to be that much better. We're also told that we will be comforted in 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whatever ye be afflicted, it is your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. And whether we be comforted it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be of the consolation. We're told that if we're suffering because of our acts as a Christian, we will be taken care of and we will be uh, comforted by Jesus in the end. Um, we can see an example of this with Job. Job was uh, tested by Satan and... Uh, he suffered greatly for it, but never did Job give up his uh, discipleship. He stayed faithful to God in everything. Let's go ahead and read uh, in Job 1 uh, a couple verses here. Job 1, verse 20. So after, before this, we see that Job, um, Satan asked God if he could tempt Job. Yeah, Satan asked God if he could tempt Job, and when he did, he took away all of his earthly possessions. And in verse 20 we, say, we see, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there, thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. After this, Satan asked if he could um, take away his uh, health. And we read in, Job uh, 2 and 9 and 10, um, Job stands firm again, even though he has lost his health. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still uh, retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did Job not sin with his lips. So even though... Uh, Everything was taken from Job in an earthly sense. Job knew that God was his salvation. And we should take um, consolation in that also. Fourth, um, even when we know we are right, we can still be wrong. And because of that, we need to search the scriptures like the Bereans in Acts 17 and verse 11. And in constantly searching the scriptures, uh, we know that we need to study our Bibles. 2 Timothy 2.15 is a common verse, and I know I use it a lot. Um, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Is study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So even if we think we're right, we still need to study our Bibles and learn from it so that we can uh, become better Christians. Because when we study, we can realize our errors. 
uh, leading to repentance. In 2 Corinthians 7, we can find out that by studying, we can learn the truth and we can realize that we are mistaken. 2 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 9 and 10. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrow, sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And we know in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 that Christ wants all of us to repent. So if we are studying our Bibles, we will find out our own errors in our lives that will teach us to become better Christians. And I can't think of a better example of this than Saul of Tarsus because he thought he was right in Acts 9. Because we know that Acts, in Acts 9, Saul was heading off to Damascus to um, throw Christians in prison. Let's read the first nine verses of Acts 9. And Saul, yet breathing out threatening and slaughters uh, against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there was a shining round, there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute uh, thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you have persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and I shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they were, uh, led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither eat nor drink. And we know later that Saul became Paul because he converted to Christianity because he realized the error of his ways. We can have that same mentality that if we realize that we are wrong, we should have a change of heart. Regardless of worldly pressure, we must remain faithful as disciples. We are told to hold fast the traditions um, in 2 Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 14 through 17. So re regardless of all the worldly pressures around us, we need to make sure that we are standing firm for God. Second Thessalonians 2, 14 through 17. Whereunto ye are called, uh, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus. Wherefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your heart and establish you in every good work, uh, every good word and work. So we understand that we need to stand fast and hold those traditions because we know that's what's right. We know that we are going to be tempted um, by the tempter. In 1 Peter 5, we know that Satan is out looking for us. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that ye may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So we see here that Satan is coming for us. He is looking to, uh, to destroy us because he's a, he's a lion coming for us. But we know that God gives us a way out um, by giving us the armor of God in Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, we know that we can uh, stand up to him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, 
that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So God provided us this protection so that we would be able to stand against the devil, and we know that our reward is that crown of life in Revelation 2 and verse 10. Revelation 2, 10, 11. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. But I think the best example for all of these, especially this one, is going to be Jesus. Uh, because in Luke 4, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. Luke 4, um, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thee will therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, and to keep thee. And in their hand they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy, dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said unto him, it is, it is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the devil had ended all the temptation. He departed from him in a, for a season. So just like Jesus, we are uh, tempted by the devil so that we need to stand firm against him also because we are prepared for it with our Bibles. But in closing, if you want to grab your songbooks um, and turn to the song uh, selected, um, <clears throat> I, I notice that our society is deteriorating. Um, trust me, I have a front row seat to a lot of it. Um, and we, we need to make sure that our lights are shining, that our discipleships are an example to those around us. We need to make sure that people can see that Christ is present in our lives. We need to illuminate God's word and present it to others because we are commanded to as disciples. There may be those tonight that have not added Christ to their lives by being baptized and becoming a new man in Christ. There may also be those who turn away from God, forgetting their call to discipleship. If any have need, please come forward as we stand and sing.